have a look at some of those as we go through. We have secure boot framework. Again, this was uh, what we were showing on the show floor the last couple of days. Uh, and then we have VSA components and QSA components uh, coming through as well. So what I want to do is bring that into uh, the next level uh, of uh, information. First of all, in terms of confidentiality of the station, is not a solution. Uh, a lot of people have asked me in the past, how do I hide the keys? How do I hide information? And the answer is you shouldn't. You practice exactly the wrong thing to do, because if you believe by hiding things, you're making them secure, you're deluding yourself, and you're making a very dangerous product. The reality is you should always assume the attacker has all the documentation. You should always assume they have all of your code base, so they've bought a device, they've fit it, they've extracted all of the code base. But you should assume they have it for the time, because there's a lot of them out there. If somebody, if you can make it, somebody can break it, and that's the reality. So instead, what we have to do is develop architectures and implementation where the only thing that we have to keep hold of is the keys. So that if a device is broken, okay, then they've got one set of keys, but that is unique for that device. If they want to break it, break another device, we have to break it all the way down, we have to fit it again to get the keys out. And of course, well, that's financially not viable for the attacker, it's hard for the attacker, and hopefully they'll find another target. So, how do we do this? Well, we need to have a broad understanding of concepts uh, and limitations of the technology. How we develop cryptography. Uh, understanding how ciphers and standard solutions like AES work is great. Symmetric versus asymmetric, signatures and certificates, authentication, fingerprinting. If you can understand all of that, then you're in a great place. Alternatively, you can leverage the APIs that are available with uh, Affinity, and um, they'll get you through uh, the problem an awful lot faster. So if we look at enabling confidentiality, True confidentiality can only be mathematically provable in that you know, we, can, we can use cryptography to mathematically prove that the system cannot be broken. Um, Synergy is bringing this premium cryptography to the MCU domain. It accelerates performance, reduces our power, and it gives us a lot more simple uh, API. What we've got up here is obviously all of the different um, engines inside the Synergy security engine. Uh, we've got our true random number generator for the next second. Hey, yes, uh, there's symmetric, asymmetric, some other symmetric uh, components here, GR1, GR3, GR6, GR5, 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 and RC4 skin uh, cipher. And then we have our secure key storage over here as well. The benefit of this gives you a minimum, minimal attack surface. Uh, you can reduce the amount of information that the system quite substantial. It's got some integrated alarms, so um, it, in effect it's got a set machine in there. If you try and attack it, force it to start leaking information, you'll actually trigger a bunch of alarms. And that can then be used like brick for a device or throw it into an exception handler. Uh, and prepare a response to that, which as I said, maybe to break it, it may be to reset the device uh, to support the attack of that one. And of course it's got this very simple API. First of all, blocks at the next level of information. So entropy is very critical to secure systems, cryptography relies very heavily on complex and variable keys. In the secure boot process which we have developed in concert with Renesis, we developed a very highly random 512 bit seed. And that's over control the key, then goes through a set of uh, key derivation functions to produce the key. If your true random number generator is not high entropy, those keys themselves will start to leak information very, very quickly. In terms of this block, it, uh, it's this SP890 compliant. This is the latest specification uh, for entropy. It really is the best in class. And again, you know, this, it's worth really focusing on because this is a true differentiator for Synergy. It's a true differentiator for platforms at leverage infinity. Um, if you're not using a true random number generator, you're using a pseudo random number generator, the right number of will break relatively quickly and relatively easy. So, yeah. This is a standard attack on devices. If you can get in, you can force the random number generator, either through heating the device, cooling the device, changing voltages, then you can break, start to break down the device if you reduce the entropy and you reduce the amount uh, of attacks that you need to figure out to make it work. So the fact that we guard against all of those uh, makes it a uh, true random number generator really key part of this. And it's very, very easy to use. So the nice thing as a Synergy user is yeah, it's there. You will then don't have to really understand the technology which is making it work. You can if you want to, but all we have to do is uh, function call. As I say, uh, we support in uh, Synergy all of the major uh, symmetric crypto blocks. Um, from a IoT perspective, again, 
really AES-128 should be your absolute baseline. Uh, while it's great to have things like triple dev uh, included uh, in synergy from a, la uh, a legacy perspective, it's not where you should start any system design today. Of course, the metric control tree uses identical keys for encryption and decryption, so the stakeholders must implicitly trust each other. Um, and keys have to be shared in advance to avoid attack access. So we have some powerful cipher support here. AES should be good for industrial applications for 20 years. Low power, simple application. In terms of AES, again, it's a really nice, simple uh, function course here. So in terms of setting the key, um, we just, you know, we just need to bring it in. We've got the key itself, key length, key schedule, and um, uh, that allows us to define which of the key lengths uh, we're going to use here. And then in terms of the actual encryption, again, very simple function call. What's its length? What's the plain text in? And what's the size of text out? So we don't need to know a lot about what's going on inside there to actually start using cryptography. This table is incredibly important. Um, cipher agility is going to be one of the big challenges of the next 20 years. The nature of cipher is that they run out of time. We have people attacking them, whether it's quantum attacks or whether it's just brute force attack. Eventually, AES-128 will not be sufficient. So what do you do? Well, you can either go and buy a new chip. That's okay, uh, I guess, and it's a good business model to your stuff. But if something is deeply embedded, then we need to be able to move it forward. And in this case, with the uh, Synergy devices on the 7 and 5, which is 492 bit, which you may want to go to, because it's obviously a uh, slightly lower performance hit, or alternative with the 256 bit. So we have crypto agility in there. We also have a bunch of chaining modes. Um, these are really, really important. Um, the basic ones are CBC and EBC, uh, electronic code book and cycle block chaining, which allow us to add um, lots of different encryption packages together. Uh, we also have the CCR and the others. And again, all of these main chaining modes are included. If you look at competitive solutions, they will normally have one of these. We won't have enough capability in there to deter attackers over the long term. You may also, you know, if you think that you're being attacked, you may want to change the chain mode at some point as well. So these are additional protections uh, in the framework of, of how we think about security. Um, in terms of the asymmetric ones, um, of course, the whole nature of asymmetric is that the public and private key are different. They're generated through a trapdoor equation, which is very easy to do in one direction, but very difficult to do in the other direction. So in the case of RSA, you can generate two primes, you can multiply those together in a modulus way, and you can come up with an answer. But taking that answer and trying to regenerate the primes is incredibly difficult. Now, you then generate, obviously, the public key and the private key. Doing this way doesn't necessarily mean that the message came from a trusted source. It just means that somebody's got your public key. So, you do have to be careful, of course, that just having the cryptography on its own doesn't prove that the message is correct, correct or it came from the right place. It just means that somebody has the key. Again, lots of advantages of having it in the uh, secure engine. Um, but fundamentally, again, as uh, probably many of you know, it's, it's an and between asymmetric and symmetric encryption. Asymmetric is very uh, challenging, it's very computationally expensive, even with an engine. So this has to be focused on authentication of devices onboarding, creating secure channels, whereas symmetric encryption is ideal for very fast, low power encryption. But once you've got the key, you've got access to everything. So really from a security perspective, it's an and. Again, I'll refer back to hopefully what some of you saw on the show floor yesterday, where we had um, the secure boot mechanism for do uploading new firmware into a device. The way in which we did that is that we took the binary uh, for our code and we encrypted it with 128 bit key, which is really, in effect, just a high entropy random number. It's just been generated on the PC. That key, in and of itself, you know, um, is temporary, it doesn't exist for long. What we have to do, though, is we can, we can take the encrypted blob, we can fly that across the internet, it's encrypted, so it's fine. But then what we have to do is we have to take that asymmet uh, sorry, that uh, uh, symmetric key, and somehow we have to get it to our manufacturing line and onto the device. And we use the asymmetric uh, component to create a very strong tunnel between the device which is delivering the keys and the inside of the chip to create that secure, robust uh, tunnel, which we can then inject the symmetric key through. So, on there, we also have the um, hash block. We use hashes for creating unique fingerprints, um, and really it helps us um, prevent modification of data. So, this can be things like a man in the middle attack or a replay attack where there's timing modification. So, very simple example of this, again, if you guys know all about hashing, I apologize, but for the people who don't, here we can see two sentences which are the same apart from one letter that we slightly changed. The nature of a hash means that the output when you do the hash is radically different. And in most cases, there, there is sufficient differentiator there. If you use SHA-1, it is theoretically possible today 
to create identical hashes if we use SHA-256, which again is part of the NSA Suite B capability. Um, then these hashes are sufficiently dif uh, different and sufficiently robust that we should be able to protect against men and military attacks, injection attacks, and others for the next 20 years or so. So there's a very good block there in terms of the, uh, the SHA, uh, the GHash, and others, again, which allow fast operation and relatively low power operation. So let's look at how we're starting to set up um, uh, a system. And um, confidentially, I'll say here's critical here. So we may have a gym, we may have a uh, running machine, we've got various different stakeholders in here, the actual athlete himself, people who have some responsibility for the machine, predictive maintenance, equipment leasing, gym ownership. Because of um, asymmetric encryption, we can share data with each of these independently without giving away the uh, private information of the runner here. At the same time, we could use an envoying technique, perhaps with some personal keys inside the next generation smartphone here, um, to deliver those keys onto the running machine and tunneling through the cloud, that means that we could take this person's uh, information and send it to his physician or his surgeon or others. And from my personal perspective, this is important, my father-in-law had a heart valve replaced. And he then had to go to some specialist gym sessions where there was a nurse in case you know, he collapsed. Whereas if you could uh, apply your um, personality to the machine in a secure way, you can share information a lot more uh, broadly without surrendering any privacy. It's all about keys. It's all about key exchange and key management. So here's the quick angle and here's how we do synergy for this. So we may need to do some pre-provisioning. So we perhaps have our, um, our watch here. Uh, so we're, we're passing over a public key for our watch into our user cloud. Um, we're taking a key from the medical guy and putting it into our personal cloud as well. We're going to pass over a key uh, from our application uh, and our medical back over to our watch. So in effect, we are saying this watch now contains all the keys uh, for our doctor, our surgeon, or whomever. So we have a secure mechanism for exchanging keys in advance. If we get to the gym, we will generate an on-the-fly public-private key pair. Why on-the-fly? Well, because for each user, for each session, we want this to be unique so that it can't be traced back to us. We then do some NFC pairing, perhaps between our watch and our running machine. We'll pass over the public key for the watch, and we'll pass back the treadmill uh, public key as well. We can then use the Envoy to set up a symmetric session between the watch and the running machine. Uh, we can pass those back. We can create then an additional tunnel via our watch back to the medical professional. We now have a secure tunnel from this machine, which is in a random gym somewhere in the world, to our own private doctor. Once we have that tunnel, and only when we have that tunnel, can we actually create a symmetric key, which we'll use to pass the data. So it is all about the keys. It's all about how we set up these uh, private tunnels and how we pass information. Now, of course, we then bring that back to Synergy itself. So we're using asymmetric key generation up here, the true random number generators, the secure storage, and the unique identifier to create this session. At this point, we're going to use some um, asymmetric acceleration to pass these across, uh, some secure storage, unique ID, uh, transport layer security, and a crypto loop to pass uh, information through the tunnel. And in this last part, we're going to use everything apart from the key generation uh, to accelerate our application. The interesting thing is, we have created an incredibly high value differentiated application out of the same piece of silicon. Never before have we been able to identify a person on a random piece of gym equipment in a random gym and pass that back to our doctors without having to share that same information with the stakeholders in the gym. The gym manager, the person who has owns the machine, the person who does the particular maintenance. I don't want my personal information going to everybody. I only want my personal information going to my doctor. So we're developing a, a capability for a brand new set of applications, but it is of this level that you have to think about how the keys are going to be passed and how we're going to manipulate these things. So does this have a length of time? Uh, the question was, does the session have a length of time? Um, you should rotate keys relatively um, well, but no, there's, there's no real um, absolute number on that. Um, so Jeopardy is critical as well in here. Uh, traditional event systems are not connected, so Synergy has been able to develop this root of trust of right personalization, protecting memory, management of certificates, and secure goods. We also have the um, JPEG the key in here, the 128-bit debug access key. Roughly take a billion, billion years uh, to crack that, uh, social engineering notwithstanding. If you set it all to ones, or you set it all to zeros, it takes less time. Um, you'd be surprised. Uh, so, that's fine. In terms of securing memory, uh, the memory protection units are really, really important. Um, memory protection units are a key differentiator in uh, the Synergy devices. So we have here the existing Cortex-M1, we have the bus national bus slave, and then we have the secure memory protection units as well. This allows us to isolate different components away from each other. 
So again, if we look at skill manufacturing, the application that we showed on the on, on the shop on the expo floor here, we can personalize keys and send them through a secure mechanism to the manufacturing. We can encrypt the application. Uh, we can send those keys through. We can validate, and then we can program them. Again, in this sort of session, we, we need to limit the depot. We need memory protection. We need asymmetric keys, uh, and lots of the other functions create this type of application. Um, Safeguarding availability is also really, really critical. Um, here's an example I like. So again, from personal experience. Um, I forgive me if you've heard this one before. So my other child was born premature. Seven weeks. He was very, very small. So we had to have him connected to a monitor for about the first 12 weeks of his life. And that was great fun. We never got any sleep because the monitor kept going off. Um, today, thankfully, we're seeing more and more devices, but what would be great is if we could connect that type of device to other systems in our smartphone. So connect it with the lights and with the alarm clock so that we wake up um, if the baby stops breathing and the lighting between our room and the baby's room all come on automatically. The interesting thing here is we've taken three very disparate, extremely useful um, types of devices and we've created potentially the most critical alarm system you will ever own as a parent. So, we, we can start developing new mobile applications so we can also send data out and to the If we can get security right, we can then also start adding value. We can send the data out perhaps to the physician again or to the doctor. We can bring in context such as the weather report. The challenge that we have is if we build more and more devices, how do we manage those? So again, application support from the OEM and home monitoring. So we're building again lots of devices in the IoT to connect and they need to have security between them. They need to be trustworthy information uh, sharing. Uh, and again, we go back to the key exchange mechanisms that we were talking about earlier. Um, availability is really important. If we look down at the baby monitor, for example, there's a set of things that may become infected. IoT system behavior and communications can become affected. Whereas the sensor, conviction, and alarm, we want these to become completely inviolate. We don't want those to be harmed in any way. So again, with Synergy, we can separate and we can isolate these different components from each other. And uh, we can do this using the memory protection unit to create a robust secure bridge underneath these ones. We can contain these inside the uh, supervisor mode and these ones inside the user mode so we have a layer of separation. I think I've run over time, so apologies for that. Um, Synergy, very expensive, very easy to use, very powerful, and ultimately, a very, very secure. So security is not an afterthought, cryptography is not sufficient on its own, we have to think about this in a wider context, and we need to leverage the right tools and the industry best practice uh, to achieve this. Okay, apologies, I ran a little bit over there. Do you want to have an hour? Okay, well, okay, there's plenty of time for questions. There we go. I knew I was bang on time. So, fabulous. Okay, so thank you very much for that. Uh, hopefully it was useful. Um, are there any questions? Can you talk about using a password verified integrity and trying to send it to the password? Yeah. So the, the, the question is when you're doing the Mac, um, or you're looking at the integrity of the, the um, should that be a, a separate value? Um, yes, you, you do want to manage for that, and you do want to manage the integrity over the long over the long term as well. Okay, sorry. I think the